It is a disgrace. And the judgment of history will be extremely harsh, of course. But we can't wait for history's judgment because we have urgent business before us, all of us. We climate scientists are like the physicians of the planet. The entire planet is running a fever. We've run all the tests, we know exactly what's happening. It really is, for the first time in the history of this planet, us. The impacts are already serious and they could soon become dangerous. And they disproportionately affect the poorest and most vulnerable in the world. There's a direct connection between the Nobel laureates this year and the issue of climate change. Because climate change exacerbates resource shortages, civil conflict, political strife, even war, and eventually refugee crises. And when those occur, the very first to suffer are women and children. And they also bear the greatest burden in recovering from disasters that are increasingly being supercharged by a changing climate. When you reflect upon it, I think you will easily see that uh, climate change is a threat multiplier, as we say, also with respect to peace and stability. We are not doubtful that this is a very real aspect uh, and precondition for maintaining peace and stability in the future. This is an emergency. We know how bad the problem is. We know we can solve it. And the biggest challenge that we are facing is leadership. We need leaders in government, so we need the governments to work on this. Uh, I am very hopeful about business changing. I, I, I see a rapid change, but it's a race against the clock. I think what we're doing now is that we don't set a price on the, uh, on the climate changes, and that is uh, a mistake. I think we need to put be a price and uh, measuring the risk of how climate changes affect the economy. Not only climate changes in a physical way, because that, is, uh, that takes time, but also the trans transition from today's uh, addiction to fossil fuels uh, on the journey towards a more greener economy. These kind of risks need to be incorporated into the models to be able to price correctly uh, the, the risk we're seeing in the future. The economics are changing and the business cases of it are clear and we are starting to shift money into more climate solutions. Now, is everyone doing that? No, but we've done some calculations that if every, um, if every pension fund across the country stepped up like New York City has uh, and invested 2% of their assets into climate solutions, we could solarize half of the homes in America. Like the, the, the scale of investment needs to clearly ramp up if we're going to hit the goals of the, of the Paris Agreement. But someone has to go first, and so we're going to try and jump into this into the void and lead the way. We're not getting that leadership from uh, from Washington D.C. right now, and so you're seeing cities all across the country step up to fill that void. It's both a moral emergency, as Al Gore pointed out, and Nobel laureate Al Gore has really done the most to educate people about the the moral or moral responsibility we have to tackle climate change. But I think the business community has a, a complementary role to play and the investor community in helping people understand the economic opportunities and to move people away from the doom and gloom of, of fear of climate change and recognize the exciting hope of better health, better economic, better economic opportunities. Uh, there's more jobs in clean energy than fossil fuels in the United States. There's a, there's a whole brighter future ahead if we can uh, tackle climate change. And, and I think the, the Nobel laureate Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King never preached, I have a nightmare. He preached, I have a dream. And I think the movement to tackle climate change will succeed better if we adopt a, a more positive out, outlook. The solutions to climate change are very exciting in terms of better health, better economic development, better jobs.